my name is Regina Lian, and here we have Monica Munoz Martinez with us, uh, joining us for an interview. Would you like to tell us about yourself? Yes, I am an assistant professor at Brown University and currently an Andrew Carnegie Fellow, and I am originally from South Texas. What projects do you work on? So I'm just finished, my first book just came out. It's called The Injustice mm -hmm. Never Leaves You. It's a history of anti-Mexican violence in Texas. And it came out with Harvard University Press in September. And so that, I've been busy traveling to give talks um, on the book, speaking to public audiences, speaking at public libraries and at universities and community colleges. Um, so I've been really thankful to have the opportunity to share um, a bit about the book with public audiences in Texas and across the country. Um, but I've also been working this year with my colleagues and refusing to forget to continue our public history project to commemorate a period of anti-American violence um, that most people don't know about, but is an important history for us to be thinking about in our, our current moment, um, but also uh, because we, we need truthful accountings of Texas history. Can you tell us a little bit about your book? Yeah, so The Injustice Never Leaves You. It's a history of racial violence in Texas, and it returns to a period of violence between 1910 and 1920, when it's estimated that hundreds, if not thousands, of ethnic Mexicans were murdered. So this was a period of violence that, um, uh, you know, there was an intersecting regime of, uh, of violence by police. Um, so some of these were Texas Rangers, the state police force, others were local law enforcement officers, um, some were U.S. soldiers, and there were also acts by vigilantes. So the, the project that I developed for the book um, is a recovery of this history, but it's also um, a book that, that uh, incorporates community memory and relies on uh, histories that were passed from one generation to the next um, to uh, to build a fuller account of this history. So part of the, that recovery work means that um, I worked with descendants, uh, Texas residents, people who had family members that 100 years ago uh, were victims of this violence, and uh, working with them to build uh, archives um, that give us access to this history because many of the episodes of racial violence weren't documented, were, uh, documented weren't recorded. Um, and so as a historian, it, it's, it requires then that we help to build and preserve archives um, of the histories. Since a lot of this history was previously undocumented, what would you say was one of the greater challenges or some of the greater challenges you encountered when you were working on this book? Well, building the archive, but you know, I would I wouldn't say that the history of violence wasn't documented. Um, so there there isn't a full record, right? Newspapers wrote about the violence. So um, you know, the Brownsville Herald wrote about the documented some of the cases and and wrote about them in their uh, publications. Um, you know, the San Antonio newspapers, uh, so the Texas press, the English language press, was writing about some of the cases of violence. Um, but there were also journalists like Jovita Idad and her family um, owned newspaper La Cronica in Laredo that were helping to document uh, and write about the crimes from a perspective that, that spoke about the history as an injustice. And so um, one of the lynchings that they wrote about was of a man named Antonio Rodriguez who was lynched in Rock Springs, Texas in November 1910. And he was accused of uh, murdering a woman named Effie Henderson. Um, so there are some, you know, there are newspaper accounts. Um, there are some records uh, that we have access to from Texas Rangers that, that wrote some reports. Um, but those records, we have to think about them and analyze them critically because uh, for a large part, those reports and those records uh, were, were um, they, they justify the violence. And so when we're looking at a, a record um, that has accounts of some of these cases of violence, what that requires is that we um, ask questions about um, how those investigations were conducted, what kinds of um, 
how people are being described. And so, you know, the, we can't assume, for example, if somebody is described as being a bandit, um, that that's the case because a hundred years ago, it was uh, quite common for anybody who looked Mexican um, to be accused uh, of being a bandit or to be treated with suspicion. And so it was a period of criminalization that then you see reflected in state accounts of this period of violence. There are anything that was particularly surprising or something that really changed your way of thinking as you were researching? Well, okay, so one thing I'll say about something that surprised me is actually how many records there were that I, that I could rely mm-hmm. on to tell these histories. And so from the newspapers, you know, that was one set of records, um, but there were also, there was also a legal history um, and an archive that I could rely on that I didn't anticipate. So I didn't know, um, and I hadn't seen uh, uh, accounts of um, widows and family members that sought justice um, immediately in this context, in this era, um, that there were uh, widows and survivors, parents of people who were murdered, um, who gave depositions and they uh, called on county attorneys and the governor and um, the state police to investigate some of these crimes. So the, there were 12 survivors of the Bodmini massacre that occurred in 1918. Um, that ended up filing a claim against the U.S. government for uh, holding the government responsible for um, the massacre that took place and and more directly the involvement of law enforcement in that massacre. And so I was really, I didn't anticipate when I started this research that there would be this legal archive um, that allowed us to see the strategies that were used by some um, survivors to try to seek justice. I also didn't anticipate uh, when I started the research that I would be, um, how do I say it, Uh, that some of the people that I was conducting oral histories with, that they would actually become a part of the book too. Um, Because what I realized is that people like Norma Longoria Rodriguez, that she, she was a part of the story. Um, You know, I wrote about the double murder of her grandfather and great-grandfather who were murdered in September 1915. Their names were Jesus Bazan and Antonio Longoria. Um, But I also wrote about Norma Longoria Rodriguez because she had done the work of preserving this family archive. She had also done the work of, you know, she'd written poetry about um, her family and um, she conducted interviews with her relatives. She wrote stories and uh, biographies of her grandmother and great-grandmother. Um, and so I didn't anticipate th- that I would have access to that kind of um, information that could tell me and help me uh, describe um, what community memory looks like, um, that in some cases it's people passing story down from generation to generation, but then there are these us, these other uh, cultural artifacts that we have access to, um, to, to really uh, get a glimpse into how these histories continue to impact people generations later. So, um, so I write about what I call vernacular history making. So vernacular history making allows me to think about the work that people like Norma Longoria Rodriguez do um, when they preserve these archives and then also write their family histories and write poetry um, that we can then discuss and teach and analyze. Um, And so they are doing, they were doing and other Texas residents have been doing a lot of important memorialization, you know, work to memorialize these histories and to preserve them in the absence of state institutions Uh, like museums or libraries doing that work. So when state cultural institutions um, don't don't, uh, lead um, in preserving these histories and then making them public, um, Texans and Texas residents have have picked up that work and they've carried that weight. Um, So I I decided that that was a really important part of the history that I needed to tell. And what drew you to tell to start talking about this part of history in particular, in the first place? Well, it's um, well, there, it's a it's a 
it's a it's a troubling history, so it's a difficult one to tell. Um, but you know, we I'll say that I'm committed to to writing the history, uh, Latinx history, and contributing to that field. I'm also um, committed to telling women's history and writing about women um, in history and being important actors in history. And so, that when I think about um, history that we need to learn from, um, you know, the history of the border and the history of uh, Latinx people living in the borderlands um, is a history that that I really strongly believe that if more people knew that we wouldn't be in the current moment that we're in. Um, most people don't know the history of the border. And so this history of anti-Mexican violence is a critically important one to recover and to continue to teach and for people to learn. Um, and so I was committed to, to writing about this history because it's a period of state sanctioned violence, right? It's a period um, of, of terror um, that shaped communities and has impacted people for generations. And so I was committed to telling that history, recovering that history. But then also, you know, the book has, um, with my collaboration with my colleagues and refusing to forget, you know, we've collaborated with Texas cultural institutions like the Bob Bullock Texas State History Museum. And we curated um, uh, an exhibit in collaboration with those curators there and then have continued to work with them um, to make this history public. But we've also collaborated with the Texas Historical Commission to unveil historical markers in the valley, um, in Cameron County, in uh, Webb County and Hidalgo County, and um, the last marker that was installed is in Presidio County. So the, in the book, I write a bit about why that kind of memorialization work is important and um, how it can happen. So, so I'm committed not only to writing the history, but also making it public. Um, so I think, that, I think that wraps up that question, <laughs> yeah. Yes. Was there something else in that question or just um, you and There's I, another part of history that you'll be focusing on in the future? Maybe in a, a future project? Well, I'm continuing mm -hmm. um, the recovery work. So I've been working with students at Brown University on a, a project called Mapping Violence. And what I realized when I was conducting the research for this first book um, is that I continue to find cases of people uh, who were murdered in this decade. Um, and I wasn't able to write about all of them. So Mapping Violence is a project that helps to build an archive, a digital archive, uh, that's, mm -hmm. so that scholars and researchers can use the archive, but also um, we're drafting and I'm writing content um, so that some of the historical lessons uh, can be used by broader publics. So the, sort of the main audiences in mind are, are researchers, historians, and scholars, um, broad public audiences that, that need to know the history um, and that have interest, and then also teachers, so building educational resources so that um, teachers can use uh, materials in their classes. And so that project, though, is uh, looking at racial violence in Texas from 1900 to 1930, but it's also um, looking at different forms of violence. So there's, you know, people that are being murdered by police, uh, the histories of, of lynchings, um, but also uh, it's more expansive than, than just moving, you know, moves beyond a body count, for example. Um, you know, we have cases of people that were tortured or people um, that were violently intimidated. And so we have some of those cases uh, also make up that a part of that archive. And it, it is a comparative, uh, tries to develop a relational understanding of, of violence. So instead of um, segregating the studies of different racial and ethnic groups, the pro mapping violence um, recovers histories of racial violence that targeted different racial and ethnic groups. So anti-black violence, anti-native violence, um, anti-Asian violence uh, in Texas. And we also have cases of people who were, um, who you might today consider white, um, but they were ethnically Anglo and so, um, or they were, they were ethnic minorities. And so uh, we have some uh, cases of German Texans and um, that were assaulted. And so, and, and, um, Texans uh, that were Jewish that were that suffered from from violence, and so 
that project, you know, is inspired by the work that I did in The Injustice Never Leaves You, um, where I kept finding cases of, in some cases, the same police officers moving around the state and targeting different racial and ethnic groups, um, but also just the realization that we can't uh, fully confront this history if we don't have a full record. And so it's um, it will be an ongoing task. It will be work that I continue to do with students um, because it's it's a challenge to find these cases. And so it's going to be an ongoing it's going to be an ongoing project. How do you um, how do you navigate all of that right now with politics and such? I guess I'm trying to say is um, for example, like in the Chacha Luck Review, we get a lot of submissions about what people feel about politics currently. Mm -hmm. um, what is your view on it right now? We have to learn from history. Um, and there are, are important lessons that we can learn from the past to, to, to take heed of what's happening today. So, um, you know, there's striking parallels between what happened 100 years ago and what happened, uh, what's ongoing today. You know, one of those is that, you know, you could look back at what happened um, in the past as this period of racial profiling where you know, pe people, because of what they looked like, um, because they spoke Spanish, you know, regardless of whether or not they were citizens, you know, many of the people who died, who were murdered, were American citizens. Um, but they suffered from the, a fear that was cast in the media, that was distributed you know, rhetoric of, um, and descriptions of, of the border as being a dangerous place. Um, Mexicans were profiled as a threat to the nation and as a threat to people. And so, um, uh, and so that had deadly consequences. And that kind of violence, that rhetoric, those, those racist descriptions of Mexicans shaped daily life for people. Um, and it also shaped laws and it shaped policing. And those institutions um, went unchecked you know, so one of the, the patterns of this period of violence is that police who committed murders weren't prosecuted. And so what that meant is that some of them had long careers in law enforcement. Um, some who committed the most egregious acts of violence uh, were asked to resign, but because they weren't prosecuted, it meant that they could go on to be work in law enforcement in local police uh, departments or they could uh, and some of them moved on to, to serve in the border patrol. So, um, so what we're facing today are calls by human rights activists and immigrant rights activists, you know, who are working to expose the ongoing abuse um, in uh, this deportation regime and in these incarceration systems that are, you know, casting this wide net um, and uh, you know, literally removing people from the communities where they are part of the social fabric. Um, but also, you know, we're denying refugees and people seeking asylum their legal rights to claim asylum. Um, so I think, you know, the, the, when I think about, you know, people being put in, in prisons, um, you know, in 1914, there were refugees fleeing the violence of the Mexican Revolution that were imprisoned in um, Fort Bliss outside of El Paso, Texas. And so, you know, this, there are striking, striking parallels. Um, so, you know, this is a, there's concerns about the kinds of um, racial profiling and how that impacts everybody, you know, it impacts entire communities. Um, so, so that's, so the, the, the parallels are striking and, and that's unsettling. But the other thing that I'll say um, about the current political climate and what that means about doing history is that because of those striking parallels and because of the, the lessons that we have to learn about the long impact of injustice, right? That, you know, the murder of one person um, shapes in entire communities. It impacts people from generations. You know, some, you know, people think commonly that, um, that time heals all wounds. And what I found in my research is that that's just not the case. Um, that injustice is something that impacts generations and it shapes uh, violence that isn't um, corrected or addressed or prosecuted shapes institutions of policing. Um, and so, 
so time does not heal all wounds. That means that you have to confront the past. You have to talk truthfully about it, about injustices. And, and that means talking about state sanctioned violence. Um, and so I'm, um, but because of how that history sheds light, shines light on what's happening today, there are many people who don't want this history to be remembered. Um, and so, so in some cases it's a museum, in some cases it's a local, um, it's a local resident, or in some cases it's people from some of the, the towns and cities um, and counties that I write about that would rather, you know, that conversation not be public. And so, um, so these are these are difficult and challenging conversations. But what I've really been inspired by are um, the teachers, the descendants, um, people who are are relatives of Texas Rangers um, who've written to say thank you for writing this book. Um, and so I'm, you know, while it makes it complicated uh, and it makes it an uncomfortable history for some people, uh, overwhelmingly when I'm giving public talks, um, you know, people just reaching out to me through social media or, or sending me emails, overwhelmingly what I hear is that people are ready for this conversation and they're grateful for the state institutions that are participating and leading the conversation. Um, and and I'm, I'm, ha I'm so glad to have had the opportunity to collaborate with descendants to tell the history. Um, but what that means though, in this climate, is that we can't pretend that this is a that this that violence existed only in the past, mm -hmm. and so um, the the you know the work um, people who a hundred years ago were working to end police abuse um, are inspiring in many ways, but there are also people fighting to end police abuse today. That, that give me a lot, that inspire me too. So this is, there are the historical people, uh, you know, people of the past like Hobi Deidad, um, you know, a sheriff uh, actually from Brownsville, uh, William T. Vaughn, who, who stood up and wrote letters and, you know, called on the governor to end the violence. Um, and I see that resilience and that commitment to justice um, today by people who are trying to end the suffering that we see um, happening in the United States um, and and across and, and really globally. So for some people who are just learning about this and would like to know more um, about their history, um, even outside of this time period, uh, do you have any resources that you would like to recommend or do you have any um, advice you'd like to give them? It's a great question. Um, well, I, hopefully they'll read my book. I think that's a good place to start. Mm -hmm. But the Refusing to Forget project, um, our website, you can just go to www.refusingtoforget.com. And that, uh, we have a collection of resources. So that includes, you know, suggested readings. So more histories um, that people can read about. Uh, can read to learn more about the history. We also have links to short essays and short interviews like this one we'll put up, um, but also podcasts. And so there's different forms of media and also documentaries um, that people can watch. So, you know, if people want to sit down and read an, a, a book or if they want to, you know, read a short opinion editorial or listen to a podcast, there's a full range. Um, but I really also encourage people you know, students and, and people to read more history that is um, just to read more history. <laughs> That's one thing. But the, you know, the sad thing is that um, historians have been, especially, you know, the, my collaborators are refusing to forget, but others who've been writing about the history of the border, the history of Latinx communities, you know, there are dozens and dozens and dozens of books that people um, should be turning to to learn about the history of immigration, the history of the border. Um, and unfortunately, you know, there are, you know, I wish that students had access to these histories in public schools, in K through 12. Um, I don't think that people should have to go to a university to, to have a chance to take a class in um, Latinx history or Chicano history. Um, but that's the reality. 
unfortunately for now, but it's changing. And thanks to the work of people like Professor Gadmona and his brother, um, Mr. Gadmona, who works in Donna High School, um, and other teachers and educators who are, are pulling together to make sure that Mexican American studies um, is something that that students in K through 12 have access to. So, you know, I'm, I'm hopeful that, that that's gonna be changing, um, but, but yes, there's, there's lots to read. And for those people who are interested in the kind of work you do with history, do you have any advice for them about how they can, well, I guess, start becoming a historian like you in the future? Oh, my goodness. Um, that's a great question. What I would say is for, I would encourage people, um, students to interview their own families. You know, if there's, um, if you, you know, a grandparent, um, a tia, uh, you know, a next door neighbor who has a life story, um, you know, start with, um, you know, maybe I can add to the website some lists um, some guides for for conducting oral histories, um, but you know, sitting down, you know, now everybody that has a smartphone, you know, has a recorder. Um, so I think you know, part of it is 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 learning um, to be active in preserving your own family history. So that's one thing to do, and then you know, having conversations about with people about their local community histories, and then you know, finding resources in your finding what resources are available to learn more about your community history. And then I think, you know, whether that's a, a county history museum um, or a local museum or at your local university, you know, the special uh, collections archives have, uh, par you know, gems, these, you know, uh, historical documents and artifacts um, that are so important to community to, to, to local histories in the border, um, but they also need help in recovering. So, um, you know, start with with helping your own family document your own your own history, um, but then you know you know go to your local special collections archivists and 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 volunteer. You know, ask them um, if there are opportunities too to work with them to help collaborate. Um, to, to help preserve local history. Thank you. Is there anything you would like to share in addition to all of this? Okay, so I think what I would say is that, um, well, I'd like to say thank you for inviting me and giving me the opportunity to, to speak, um, but also to, to thank you for helping to encourage um, authors and supporting authors um, through your review, because since, you know, the opportunities that I've had to travel back to Texas to give talks um, in Edinburgh and in Austin and in San Antonio, um, I've really been inspired by the literary community, by the authors, the poets, um, the historians, the, you know, just the, there's such a, a warm and encouraging literary community of writers that I've just been um, really moved and inspired by this past year, and so I'm I'm thankful for for the work that you're doing to help to to build a community and so, to support writers and to inspire more people to write. So thanks. Thank you so much for joining us too and answering all of these questions. Thank you, um, and we look forward to seeing what work you share um, for the special feature as well.